Hey, how are you, everyone? This is another edition of the Indie Cafe 2. Today we have a very special guest, Lenny Kay. I call him El Rock Maestro. <laughs> Lenny Kay is a guitarist, composer, record producer, award-winning writer, and member of the Patti Smith Group, inducted in the New Jersey Hall of Fame in 2021. And uh, let's start off from his early, some early background. Uh, Lenny, I read that you were very early in life a record collector, right? Not only very early in life, very late in life. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I seem to, uh, they seem to breed. But I do love records. I, I think it's quite a miracle that we can actually listen to sound. And, uh, you know, it's not been that long, maybe uh, 130, 140 years that we're able to hear these things played back. But, uh, yeah, I love records. Uh, I've spent my whole life in record stores and meeting people through records and, and, and uh, being part of the great subculture that is record collecting. You were a reviewer for Jazz and Pop magazine, right? Right. So I got my start as a journalist. Uh, mm. I was friendly with a guy named David Wally, <clears throat> who uh, I went to Rutgers with. And his girlfriend was Patricia Keneally, uh, actually Patricia Keneally Morrison, because she did marry Jim Morrison in a, a Wicca mm. ceremony. But anyway, she was the editor of this magazine called Jazz and Pop, which was kind of a cool magazine. It featured avant-garde jazz and rock and roll. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, that was where I did my first writings. I think my first review ever was the Small Faces uh, Ogden's Nut Gone Flake album. Oh, uh, wow. That's where a great I album. think my first line was, how do you describe an aesthetic experience? Which, of <laughs> course, which, which is, you know, what you do as a writer about music. And it's it's not that easy. But, uh, you know, sometimes you figure out a way to bring a piece of art to life and illuminate it and hopefully uh, some, help somebody to uh, understand it a little bit better, including yourself. You were a member of the Jim Carroll Band, right? Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of playing with Jim in the early 80s. Uh, his guitar player, his rhythm guitar player left on the eve of uh, their second album, the group's second album, uh, um, called uh, Dry Dreams. Anyway, I wrote a song with Jim for that album called Still Life. And, um, you know, his guitar player just left. They were set to go to New England uh, in two days. So I said, Jim, I'd be happy to play guitar with you because you're my brother. And uh, it worked out great. He was an incredible performer. Yeah. Uh, his music was so you know, I mean, he, he just got down on one knee and, you know, delivered it to the crowd. We had stage divers. It was very exciting. And it was a crack band. I was I was uh, I played with them for approximately, uh, I don't know, almost two years uh, and made wow. a complete record with Jim. Uh, uh, I write your name, his third album. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I had to leave the band uh, because I had a six month old daughter who needed um, attention. Uh, and so, <laughs> happy to we know about that. I yeah. uh, know it's you know I mean life on the road it takes you away from your family and uh, and and at that moment I really wanted to to watch her grow up. And you had two groups. Uh, uh, tell us about these two groups: the Zoo and Connection. <laughs> well, the Zoo was my college band. Uh, I'm one of the few people that actually went to college didn't uh didn't you know wasn't trained for anything really but i was a major in american history and also a minor in having a rock and roll band uh, the, zoo, <laughs> the band that played the local fraternities uh you know uh, the record hops the uh you know anywhere you would set up uh, college mixers and uh, it kind of, both of them actually became what I learned how to do. I think of myself as a cultural historian, but I also think of myself as a rock and roll musician. And both of them kind of fold together um, as, as who I've been able to become ever since I graduated school, which is, uh, geez, I don't know, 55, 56 years ago. Crazy. I call you a high-end musicologist, Lenny. 
Well, I, 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 you know, I love, I love to learn about music. I'm a big fan of the rabbit hole of find a group, find out how they connect to people in their, in their universe. And, um, you know, just kind of expand your knowledge. Uh, it's, it's a lot like my book, Lightning Striking, where, you know, you you go into a kind of moment in time and space where things happen and then you kind of have to figure out why they happened. It's not just, um, it's, it's not just the, the people uh, on stage, it's the entire senius of the ecology of, of, of a moment in time, you know, what's happening in the outside world, right. what's happening within the music, all of these things, the audience, what the audience desires. Uh, so all of this kind of gnarls together. So I, you know, I, I, I like to know the history of what I'm writing about and singing about. And I feel that both of them kind of inform who I've been able to become as not only a writer, but as a musician. Right. So in 1974, you're working at Village Oldies on Bleecker Street and you run into Patti Smith. Tell us about the formulation of that group. Well, I mean, I actually I first met Patti when I was working at Village Oldies in 1970. Uh -huh. um, I had written in Jazz and Pop uh, an article called The Best of Acapella, which was a kind of niche doo-wop um, thing that uh you know was kind of it was mostly popularized by oldies stores which meant that doo-wop's moment had passed it was kind of really small groups standing on the corner singing no uh instrumental accompaniment and i kind of knew about it and i thought there was something very i don't know innocent and sweet and heartfelt and i knew something about it because i was going to oldie stores at that time and very much into group harmony records. And, you know, this is a moment in time after the Beatles have, have arrived on the pop charts. So all of a sudden, all of these groups who aspired to sing on the street corner uh, were rendered obsolete, including myself. I mean, you know, in 1962 or three, I wanted to be a high tenor in one of these uh, doo-wop groups. And uh, then I saw the Beatles and immediately started learning how to play electric guitar. But mm -hmm. the fact is, is that um, Patty read this article. It came out uh, at the end of 1970 in Jazz and Pop. And uh, she called me up where I was staying. We kind of had some mutual friends. And uh, she told me how much the article moved her and how she could relate to it because she grew up in, um, you know, South South Jersey in Philadelphia. So she was familiar with this music. And so she would come into uh, the record store where I worked. And on Saturday night, I put on some of our favorite records. We'd do the Bristol Stomp. We'd listen to My Hero by the Blue Notes or <laughs> Today's the Day by Maureen Gray. And, you know, we just kind of got friendly. And uh, a couple months later, uh, in February of 71, she was going to do her debut poetry reading at St. Mark's Church. And she wanted to shake it up a little bit. She didn't want to just be up there reading poems and, you know, you know, no, no excitement or drama. So she asked me if I would accompany her on guitar. She knew I played a little guitar. Uh, and so what I did was I went over to the loft that she was sharing with Robert Maplethorpe and, uh, you know, put some elementary rhythms behind the way she chanted her poems. It wasn't hard, you know, she had a sense of, of, of energy to her and all I had to do was kind of watch how she breathed. And uh, we did this in February of 71. Uh, we didn't do it again until November of 73. It wasn't supposed to be like a band or let's get a, you know, an act together. It was mostly, uh, <clears throat> you know, just kind of a, a one-off, but, then in November, she did another poetry reading and asked me to come up and do a couple songs with her. And then, and then, and then, and then. And so, you know, no. by, you know, you know, by the spring of 1975, when we were playing at CBGB's, we were as close to being a rock and roll band as we could, even though we didn't have a drum yet. And then no. we met J.D. Dougherty and he was... Mm -hmm 
doing the sound system at CBGB's with components from the stereo system. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and then by, you know, that June of 75, we had the, the last pieces of being a rock band. But I'm always very just so happy that we were able to become one organically that we didn't start mm -hmm. out saying, hey this is cool let's have a rock band and have it sound right. like every other thing by the time our slow evolution passed uh we had a rock band that sounded like us which was a great a great blessing really yeah you produced a uh, single called hey joe right Yep, in uh, June of 1974, amazingly. It'll be, uh, geez, it'll be 50 years next year. Um, wow. It was more an experiment to see, you know, we would play these places, Max's Kansas City or uh, folk clubs. We knew we were having an effect on the audience. They were sometimes a little bewildered. We'd do these songs and they would lead into improvisations. And we would just kind of see where they went to. And people were definitely fascinated and magnetized by patty's flights of fancy but again we didn't know how this would be accepted on a record and so we uh got three hours uh at electric lady uh, robert maplethorpe paid for them and uh you know that's when we recorded our version of hey joe and um <clears throat> also uh uh the flip side piss factory um right. you know just kind of seeing what we sounded like. And since I knew from working in Village Oldies and also knowing that Oldies stores had pressed records and then sold them in their stores, <clears throat> I knew how to do that. So we pressed up 1,500 copies of uh, our initial 45 and uh, sent them out to the world. And, uh, you know, who knew? You know, I really love the Horses album you were on also with Patty. Well, you know, it's it's what we were doing. Uh, it's how we understood ourselves. Making a, a debut album is is kind of looking in a mirror. It's almost like a psychodrama. You're, you know, you're not playing live. You're not, you know, high volume or the crowd is urging you on or, you know, uh, the the walls are vibrating from what you're doing. It's somewhat clinical to be in a recording studio. And it's it also you get to hear what you sound like without all of the other uh, distractions that come from live performance. If you make a right. clam in a live performance, you know, well, you're on to the next note. But if you're working in the studio, it's it's a lot more clinical. Not that there's not an inspiration towards that as well. I mean, you know, if you listen to horses, uh, Birdland which began as like a three and a half minute poem set to song, uh, <laughs> kept getting longer and longer as our <laughs> producer John Cale said, if you want to do something improvised, mm. you want to find that magic moment. And the song just kept stretching and stretching and stretching. And pretty soon it, it hit the peak that it did on, uh, on uh, horses, which is, uh, you know, a beautiful intimation of process. And also for me, I loved. I, I Patty gave a talk, and I was I answered this question about Maplethorpe. Uh, you know, I knew she was close with Maplethorpe, but the the album cover is, is such a beautiful photograph by Robert. Well, you know, I mean, it is Patty's introduction to the world. Essentially, yeah. she you can see the sense of confidence and self possession she has on that album cover, and you know, she knew Robert intimately. Right. I mean, right. there was only 12 shots on that roll of film. That's all he oh, took. Really? Like wow. one of those uh, digital, you know, yeah. you know he know got his shot. He knew he had the shot. And uh, it's become an iconic portrait <laughs> of, of an artist. You know, getting back to Robert Maplethorpe, did he take uh, any, any photos of you? Oh, there's one on the back of horses. <laughs> is that the only one though yeah. i mean i think so yeah yeah yeah, I mean, yeah i'm in a white oh, so shirt you know oh. uh i'm looking very serious uh so he didn't just like you know take of you being no. around because you're around patty so much and he, oh, was... he wasn't around us that much you know i mean he wasn't he, he was doing his thing uh you know robert is more of a stylized photographer he wasn't like uh 
a candid snapshotter. Um, you know, he, he liked the portrait and always did. And so, the, you know, the picture on the back of horses of me in that white shirt uh, is my stylized Robert Maplethorpe photograph. So now we'll get into the, I'm calling it the vinyl resurgence. In 2010, Judith and I authored a book called 545s. And we wanted someone to write related to that subject matter. And the first name was your name, Lenny. And I'm so glad you wrote it. It's a beautiful uh, introduction to the book also. And uh, I want to read something about it because you always had a magic of words. That's one okay, thing about you. Do. A single stands alone. An album, by its very definition, relies on segue and assemblage the emphasis on the artisan. But in a single, the song takes precedence. Though artistic context may be generated over the chronological accumulation of a career, the listening experience has a beginning and an end. When the needle runs out of track, all that comes between is finite. Appreciated on its own terms, a single, like our individual lifespan, is a world unto itself. And then at the end, I love, at the end of the introduction, you wrote these several sentences I love. It says, I look at the sleeve, the faces, human, type, stare out at me. They're about to start singing. Give them a whirl. Lenny K. Love it, Lenny. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed writing it. To me, uh, singles are my favorite storage medium, as we call it. I just like the fact that you can, especially in America, pile a bunch of them on your thumb and flip through them. Um, it's it's a very singular experience. Um, I, I like digging around in them myself and have quite a few that uh, need revisiting every so often. Oh. Yeah, I, and I remember you coming up to my apartment. This is the key. You had the original 45 box with the handle on it. I love that. You were really, I knew right then the sincerity of your uh, of what your head trip was. You know? Well, I just like, you know, I just like 45s. I mean, yeah. they're yeah. very handy uh, when I'm a disc jockey. Uh, that's pretty much what I spin. And um, I don't know, I just love them. Uh, I, to me, they're, they're how mu music... Uh, is meant to be absorbed uh, beyond, you know, I mean, that was interesting what you read because an album, it's really about the artist. You can see the artist from different uh, angles and dimensions and, you know, there's, it's a fuller picture, but a single really rises and falls on its moment to moment gratification. And uh, I don't know, I just, I just love them, you know. <laughs> she could have so what is your viewpoint on vinyl itself? I mean, as, uh, you know, I know the sound. That's the one thing, right? The sound. Well, you know, to me, if you like the sound, I mean, yeah, it's a little warmer. It's a little this. But in the end, you know, once you listen to something three times, whatever you're playing it on, I have CDs, I have 78s, I have cylinders. I mean, in the end, whatever, quote, storage medium you use, it's all about the song and the emotion beyond that. And, um, you know, to me, <clears throat> I like vinyl. I like to hold things in my hand. You know, I, I know I could, you know, holler at uh, Alexa and have her play something, but I like to see the label. I like, I like the artifact. Um, that said, you know, uh, and I have a lot of, you know, I like the album. I like yeah, the album, yeah. the concept. Um, but then I grew up in the great album era. So I don't know today, you know, I mean, sometimes I wish I could get like a little single of whatever my favorite pop song is of the moment. Um, yeah. But in the end, you know, really whatever I'm listening to, however the high end of the fidelity is or the low end, you know, uh, I have things to play music all over this house, a really nice uh, setup in my music room with some Moran's turntable and really, you know, mega speakers and, you know, and then I have like a piece of crap upstairs where I keep most of my <laughs> lives and they sound right. good too. 
<laughs> so, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a sound fetishist. Some people really like to listen to the sound. I don't, mm-hmm. I listen to the performance and the mm-hmm. part. That's the kind yeah. of producer I was too. I right. let the engineer take care of the frequency responses. But in the end, I want to make sure that there's a great hook in there and that the artist is revealing their soul and all of the above. And, uh, you know, and you can hear that no matter what you listen to it on, whether it's coming over the radio or whether right. it's, uh, in your house or, you know, just, you know, sitting in a dentist's office, right. and some, you know, white wedding comes on and you think, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I want to add to what you're saying because I'm of the generation of, you know, holding a record cover in my hands while I'm listening to the music that's playing on the record player. And that experience was is such a incredibly, like you, you just said, you described it. It's, it's such an incredible experience um, that I think the present contemporary generation is missing out on. Well, maybe, but then the contemporary generation doesn't have a wall of records that needs to be hauled <laughs> from one, you know, place you live to another. I right. mean, you know, what do you do with this stuff? Um, I have a great record collection, but in the end, you know, it's it's a lot of weight, and uh, it'll go know. into the archives. Well, you know, the archives of the world. <clears throat> yeah. But, You know, I mean, again, it's whatever, you know, I grew up in a time when you held the artifact in your hand, when you looked at the album cover and, you know, ground up your pot in the double album. So, you know, you could, uh, you know, and I like like the fact that you can flip through all these records. I mean, in my town, uh, Stroudsburg uh, in Pennsylvania, we have the Main Street Jukebox, a great, great resource full of vinyl records. And uh, I like to go down there and leaf through them. You know, do I, it's, it, I find it more rewarding than leafing through CDs or cassettes or, you know, mm-hmm. going through playlists on uh, whatever your streaming uh, musical provider is. But the fact is, is that however you hear music, if it moves you, that's the important thing. Everything else is the accoutrement. I yeah. like I like the big, you know, I, I'm a liner note writer, so I like when you can read those liner notes mm-hmm. instead of getting them in a small CD package or right. not, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, now if you, they're not packaging stuff, um, you know, you're just hearing random songs over the air, you know, you don't have that context. But mm-hmm. I like, I really like, um, I like the artifact. I like yeah. holding it in my hand. I like the right. way look at the label, you know, but hey, I worked in a record store, so <laughs> I'm, I'm predisposed to all of that. So I want to go on, um, you produced first two Suzanne Vega albums, and that includes a single, Luca, which was nominated in 1987, Grammy Record of the Year. I know, amazing, wonder, wonder, wonderful artist, um, so great, um, so unique and so <clears throat> necessary for her time. Mm. I mean, Suzanne came along at a time when, especially through MTV, artists had gotten quite cartoonish, not even in a bad way, you know, Twisted yeah. Sister, Cindy Lau, mm-hmm. very colorful, very loud, very forthright, uh, Def Leppard, you know, and here's Suzanne coming along and kind of turning down the the volume and the just having the intimacy of her voice and her acoustic guitar and whatever sensitive arrangements went along with it and i I sometimes believe that the culture calls for an artist to represent the change in mood of a culture i believe that with patty too Uh, you know that they're needed to have somebody to to resurrect the power and the glory of the artistic element in rock and roll at while keeping it not as heavy and and weighted as art you know Mm -hmm. to to make sure that you know you could you could understand it and hear it 
And sometimes, you know, that moment in the culture, really, you know, the culture called out for Nirvana and all the bands lumped under the appellation of grunge because, you know, that what they followed, the uh, flashy uh, bacchanal of hair metal in Los Angeles, uh, you know, sometimes you just, it's a reaction, it's a correction. It moves back and forth. And that to me is how culture and music moves forward. And I'm all about right. forward movement. I'm not one to say, oh, it was better than, you know. And I grew up in it, so I relate to it maybe more. But I think music it lives in the present tense. I think music mm -hmm. is very important to be experienced in its time, you know. Uh, and musics have a lifeline, you know. Mm -hmm. Dixieland jazz or swing or bebop or... You know, you you name it, piano music of the mid 19th century, a la Chopin. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, musics get explored, and then it's time to move forward. And in some ways, I believe that about rock and roll. Rock and roll never die, believe me. Uh, but on the other hand, it goes from a, being a music of innovation to one of interpretation. It's like the blues. You know, there's great, great, great blues players out there. But they're not going to play the blues any different than the blues was played in the 50s and the 1960s. Yeah. And that, then it becomes part of this great kind of smorgasbord of musics that are available to utilize and move forward. When hip hop came along and they were sampling uh, a lot of uh, great things, you know, you could see that evolution happening. Here's using pieces of the past to make the future. And I believe that continues on today. I got a couple of books out that you were quoted in, and we'll talk about that. One is Anthony DeCurtis, Lou Reed of Life, which Judith and I are actually mentioned in. Um, and it's a discussion on Lou meeting Metallica. And you are quoted by saying, I think Lou and Metallica met equally. But if anything, Metallica seemed a bit cowed by Lou, which really makes me chuckle. And Lou probably chuckled inwardly too, because he knew he had the goods. That's no matter how dark Masters of Puppets is, it's not as dark as Sister Ray. That's the truth. I mean, you know, got to say Metallica, it's like, <laughs> uh, like a pop band compared to some of the places that Lou explored as an artist and as a musician. And, um, you know, what can I say? It was a great collaboration. I believe it was Lou's last great collaboration. Right. So, uh, you know, but he, you know, I mean, I was privileged to know Lou. I went motorcycle riding with him. That was completely fun. Um, and uh, he knew that I, I enjoyed his, his permutations, his, his tributaries and sidelines and, I don't know. He was just a great artist. And at this point, I participated in many Lou Reed tributes, not just for Velvet Underground stuff, but for his solo career. And it's amazing. A lot of albums, which one kind of dismissed at the time, so songs in there are so great. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, his his legacy is is very special. Uh, he He was... He was a great artist, and uh, I was very glad to be quoted in, in Anthony's book and uh, to be a, a part, to share a couple of days in Lou's life. Judith and I uh, designed with Sylvia Reed Magic and Lost New York album and uh, the Velvet 93 tour, and we were so honored. He was such a great person, and... Uh, in our life, uh, as you speak about, Lenny, in your life. Let's go on to the next book, which I chose, which is Remain in Love by Chris Franz. And Chris quotes this, an early CBGB friend and fan was Lenny Kay. He was full of encouragement and warmth. As guitarist in the Patti Smith group, in my mind, he was at the pinnacle of the CBGB hierarchy. When I was still... At RISD, I had bought the great album he curated and compiled called Nuggets, original artifacts from the first psychedelic era, 1965 to 1968. 
and we played several tracks from that album with our band, uh, The Artistics. Lenny always came to our early shows when sometimes there was only 10 or 20 people there, and we could hear him cheering at the end of each song. I thought that was beautiful. I mean, Chris is so warm. Totally. Uh, and one of my one of my very best music friends like you. But, you know, uh, it's a beautiful writing, right? Right, Lenny? Well, he's a great guy. You know, I, I, I believe that, um, you know, him and Tina don't get the credit they deserve sometimes for formulating the talking head sound. I mean, uh, they, you know, Chris, Chris loved Hamilton Bohannon, deep, deep, deep uh, soul music. And, uh, you know, what a, what a great band. I mean, I was happy to be their fan. And if there was only 10 people in the audience, well, that was mostly only 10 people in the audience for everybody because everybody was just starting out. You know, it hadn't been really discovered. Yeah, and, yeah. And that to me is one of the great things where you have time to make your mistakes, to understand your music, to go up this route or that route and see what works in, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in, in an audience uh, situation. CBGB was not kind of even known for its first year and a half or so. It was mm -hmm. definitely uh, very much off the beaten path on a, on a street in New York City that was skid row, essentially bands mostly playing for each other. And um, I think that that moment of incubation uh, before, you know, the world found out about it was very important for the development of all of these bands, all of whom were very, very different from each other. Uh, Tom Verlaine's once said that each band was like an idea in itself. Um, you know, the kind of, there was an atmosphere that was referred to as punk, but the only, only really punk band on the scene was the Ramones who helped invent the template of punk. Right. You know, the, and, 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 you know, short, sharp, shocking lyrics. Um, right. <clears throat> but really, uh, they were all very different. And so they all had time to figure themselves out. I yeah. wonder today with the instant gratification of the internet, whether a band has that time to kind of season themselves and understand who they might be instead of all of a sudden presenting themselves to the world perhaps too early. I mean, I think of that with Patty. I mean, it took us almost two years to arrive at Horses to figure out what exactly it was we're doing, how to do it, how to not make it predictable, how to not make it not what it should be. Mm. And so uh, I, I really cherish those moments in CBGB where the bands just were f playing for each other, essentially. And uh, nobody knew what was happening uh, except for a select few. And then the world. Which leads me, ironically, into the next book, Siren Song, authored by our friend Seymour Stein, who recently passed away, who was such a big mentor to me and me and Judith. We, oh, I designed totally. so many albums for them, the Ramones, Talking Heads. I worked on Pretenders, name it. Judith and I worked on Lou Reed, Velvet, but it goes on and on. But anyway, you wrote this fantastic book, and in it, you, you are quoted. It says... Uh, Craig Leone had led Seymour, I believe, down to CBGB's to listen to the Ramones. To avoid running into Hilly, I stood outside. It was mid-November, but yet a warm night. I was chatting to Lenny Kay when all of a sudden I heard the warm-up band playing a strangely hypnotic air that I later found out called Love Goes to Building on Fire. It was like nothing else I've ever heard. And my heart started pounding with excitement. That isn't Hilly's band, I said to Lenny. No, of course not. This is talking heads. <laughs> I know. Me and Seymour would always uh, stand outside and sing doo-wop songs. That's what oh, really? Like. Wow, yeah, I yeah. love it. I mean, yeah. you know, ooh, stony yeah. weather. 
you know, we, we would have fun. And, you know, I mean, that was the great thing about Seabees is that you could wander in, watch some of the band, wander out, hang out with your buddies. Right. It, it was very loose and all, all respect and love to Hilly because uh, he really, he didn't attempt to steer the ship. He didn't yeah. suddenly say, wow, this is cool. I think I'll start telling the bands what to play or no, he let it happen which is the mark of a great club owner. I mean, simple as that. Uh, right. He was just a, a good guy. And, uh, you know, and, and Seymour and I would be hanging outside. And I remember that moment, you know, he all of a sudden, you know, we're in the middle of a, yeah, woo -wee! You know, <laughs> and then he's gone. And that's when he the talking heads, which is a really sweet story. So now we'll get on to a, a a book that recently came out called Linger On, uh, The Velvet Underground, Legend, Truth, Interviews by Ignacio Julia, who uh, has you interviewed with Lou Reed, Sterling Morrison, Maureen Tucker, John Cale, Nico, Doug Ewell, Lenny Kay, Gerard Belanga, Jackson Brown, Todd Haynes, contributions from Deb Goog, Bobby Gillespie, and Thurston Moore. Uh, this book is a great book, and uh, tell us about your interview in it. I believe it's from, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somewhere in the 70s. I, mm -hmm. I can't quite remember. Uh, I was doing a lot of work for Hit Parader, Richard Robinson's um, um, pop magazine, and uh, sometimes under a variety of names, since there was only three or four of us working for the magazine. So I interview Lou, and then I'd write something about Led Zeppelin under the name of Dave Salmon, which is Salmon Dave backwards. And, you know, it was kind of pop journalism. Uh, one of the things Richard taught me was don't get too precious about your writing. You know, we all <laughs> like to be great writers, but on the other hand, don't get too precious. Just, you know, I'm like a beat reporter, you know, knock it out and go on to the next thing. And if, uh, you don't have the right quote, well, make it up, but just make sure that the artist would have said it. Um, you know, perhaps that's a little, you know, my, but, you know, you're writing fan magazine stuff. But I did an interview with Lou, um, I believe it was around the time of Coney Island Baby, but I can't be positive. I haven't, yeah. <clears throat> I haven't looked uh, at the book in recent months. And, you know, I, 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 as a working journalist, you just, you know, I probably interviewed Lou three, four times mm -hmm. in various situations. So, but he was a good yacker <laughs> and, uh, you know, and a good guy. I mean, yeah, you talk how close you were to Lou in the, in the interview, you know, how important. Well, you know, we liked each other. I never worked with him, so I didn't have to go through the Lou thing. Yeah. Uh, but we liked, you know, we like motorcycles and we like doo-wop records. And when he was at Max's during the uh, Velvet Underground's last stand in 1970, we were talking about EC comics, uh, the horror comics, uh, Crypt of Terror, Haunt of Fear, and uh, Walt of Horror. And I loaned him my collection of EC comics and I went away and that was the week that Lou left the band and went back to Long Island. And I thought, oh, cripe, you know, he has my comics. I'll never see him again. Well, what can you do? It's Lou Reed. But, yeah. you know, a month or so later, I got a, an envelope in the mail from Lou with my comics in it. Oh, so, really? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Really cool. Lightning Striking, your new book, which I'm, yeah. was amazing. Um, Talk about musicologists. I mean, this book is filled with stories. I'm going to read a little uh, quote from the introduction. Lightning right. striking traces rock and roll's geographic and temporal journey and shifts in style and identity as it moves from epicenter to epicenter. The stopovers where music evolves and renews, distinct with elements of chance, cunning, inspired personalities, major players, hustlers, and bystanders. And I liked what you ended the introduction with. These sentences are amazing. You making a loud noise in the night, a strobe of incandescent bolt. Count the seconds from flesh to thunder. That's how long it lasts. And then the storm, lightning, to be filled with light. Such beautiful words, Lenny. 
Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, I truly believe that. Uh, I, I love writing my book. I have to say uh, it was a real it was a real journey. It took me six years. I got deeply into each of the many transformative moments. And uh, I have to say that, you know, I've, I, I wouldn't change a sentence. Um, mm. it, I, I was, you know, I've never wanted to write a memoir. Uh, I'm too much of a worker be really to, you know, go back in time. But I did make myself a minor character, whether I experienced these moments in time from afar, as I did, you know, Memphis in 54 or Philadelphia in 59 or started to participate in them as in Liverpool, 62, San Francisco, 67, Detroit, 69, and of course, New York City, 1975. Uh, right. It's, it's, you know, and when I was there, I could either say how it affected me, how it, how it altered me, or what actually I did. And uh, I, I was able to tell the story of the music I love in yeah. a way that, yeah. you know, is a lot of historical fact in there, but I have to say, really, it's it's an easy read, really it is. <laughs> yeah, and a mind-blowing book for me. I mean, it's like uh, reading some of these books, like Anthony de Curtis's book about Lou, reading uh, C Siren Song, another great book uh, with the, uh, by Seymour, and your book, I mean, these are really info, music, uh, ecology type information that everybody should read to tell you the truth, you know? I well, mean, you know, we like to find out how things happened, why they happened, um, all of the above. Yeah. Uh, I, I am a historian. I'm a cultural historian. But that doesn't mean that I sit back and appreciate things from afar. I try to get deep into the whys and the hows and the, and how it affects you and to hear the music without the conscious mind. I mean, music, you know, you can know if you're listening to a classical piece, you know, it helps to know what the score is and what the composer had in mind. But in the end, you're just listening to it and see how it affects you. And yeah. to be honest, that's pretty much how I've appreciated music. I, I, I feel so lucky that I get to live my life within music. I wake up in the morning, you know, maybe I'll be working on my serious underground radio show. So what records yeah. will I be spinning? And what can I say about them that hasn't been said a million times? And, you know, what kind of jokes I can make? And I can listen to it. And then I can get the guitar out and kind of play along. And then I can you know, who knows? I mean, the world of music is fascinating. Having really lived it, I don't know. I mean, probably I bought my first record in 1958. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've, I've kind of participated in the entire lifeline of this music we call rock and roll. And <clears throat> I don't know. It's, I still find little rabbit holes to, mm. to explore, you know, there's still songs I haven't heard. Uh, I go to a 45 uh, record fair and I walk right. in, maybe right. there's a half a million records there. Yeah. And I like to think I'm pretty knowledgeable and I maybe know 15%. You know, and you know that if you spend some time, you're going to find records that are as good as any that you know. And that's a, a beautiful thing. I find music endlessly fascinating and I'm just glad to be a part of it. You know, in whatever way I am, you know, whether it's a, a writer, a musician, a, a fan, a dancer, um, you know, it's I, 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 I'm quite nurtured by music. Yeah. And, and you're very uh, I don't know how to describe it. You're very creative. I mean, even the 45s that you gave us in your book are not the normal 45s you normally would see, but they're great groups. You know, well, and that's to me what that's what that's what it's about. You know, I mean, Nuggets, I get a lot of accolades for Nuggets and it is the 50th anniversary year. But the fact is, is that, yeah, it's about garage rock, which we all yeah. like garage right. rock. Right. But on the other hand, it really is about great records. And if you listen to my original Nuggets, it's only some of it's 
what we now refer to as garage. You know, there's orchestral things like, uh, you know, uh, Sagittarius, My World Fell Down, and there's weird pop records, uh, The Mojo mm -hmm. Man, and, you know, there are the Seeds and there are the Standells and all those groups that we associate with the, the great garage rock bands. But, you know, to me, in the end, what's made it live on is the fact that they're all great records. Yeah. Whatever they're, whatever, they're, wherever, whence they came, wherever they, whence they came. And let's talk about Nuggets. Educate the people. You have a very big 50th anniversary coming up at City Winery at the end of right. July, which is fan. Congratulations. And thank tell you, us about, you. tell the people about Nuggets. It was an album that uh, Jack Holzman of Electra Records, I worked briefly as a talent scout for them. They uh, they didn't really appreciate anything I found for them or, or, you know, waved a flag for. But on the other hand, Jack had this idea of an album called Nuggets, which would gather together um, songs that seemed to have been lost by the wayside, even if the timeline was only four or five years before that. You know, it was that weird transition where rock and roll was moving from pop 45 singles to the albums, you know, the psychedelic albums. And that's why I called it Original Artifacts from the First Psychedelic Era. And um, anyway, he gave this to me, he didn't give me many suggestions. Uh, and I just kind of went on my own. Uh, I was working at Village Oldies at the time, and I just kind of, yeah. I, know, I like that record. Let's put it on. You know, I was a little self-indulgent. And uh, I don't know, it just seems to have lasted. It never sold that much when I first put it out. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, its cumulative effect in the culture really seems to have made a place for itself. And uh, this 50th anniversary year uh, um, uh, kind of commemorated by Rhino Records with their five LP box set, uh, the original two discs from volume one. Volume two, as I imagined it in 1973, even though the project never happened. And then a fifth disc of kind of strange mongrel things I considered along the way that never really made the cut. Um, and really, it's a very good listening experience. And uh, in uh, May, we did a concert in L.A. with the Wild Honey people um, who uh, learned those songs, 32 songs, <laughs> amazingly, every note. Uh, went up to San Francisco, more guest stars, and uh, you know, Cyril from the Flaming Groovies, um, uh, Jello Biafra. In L.A., we had Susanna Hoffs and Weird Al and, you know, a couple electric prunes and a couple of leaves. It's really been great. And and the CD Winery will kind of bring it to this coast. We have two nights. I believe it's the 28th and 29th, Friday and Saturday of the last weekend in July. And uh, yeah, it's great to play these songs. It's really fun. And uh, we're going to have a good time. Got to love it. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your award in France. That's the one. The award in France, the letters. Uh, you know, I don't know how to pronounce I'm it. Sure I don't know how to pronounce it. letters. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> Patty's big in France. And uh, so uh, I was quite honored. Uh, we were rehearsing at uh, the Olympia for our show. We're having sound check. And then they called me over to uh, a local, uh, local place and presented me with my... Uh, you know, Chevalier badge and my Chevalier uh, letter, letter, and from the Minister de Coucher. And uh, yeah, it's really, you know, I mean, awards are great. I have a couple of them on the wall, but, you know, to me, I'm all about the work that I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to wake up. I don't tend to think about what I've done because uh, that's then. I'm only concerned with what I'm doing at this very minute. And as soon as I get off from you, uh, Spence, I'll be in this, uh, you know, uh, basement full of uh, guitars and amplifiers and stuff. And um, yeah, I'll be, uh, you know, working on something, a piece of music. Maybe I'll be learning some of the, uh, the um, 
songs for the Nuggets thing, or I'm playing the Johnny Sunders birthday bash uh, next week, and I'm going to be doing the traditional uh, Can't Put Your Arms Around a Memory. And I've recently gotten fascinated with Joan Osborne's uh, One of Us, If God Was One of Us. So I'll be singing that. And I don't know. It's just a way to connect with music. I feel, you know, very lucky that that's what I do in life. Well, this is a song because we all, over a lifetime, accumulate many things. And uh, I have certainly done that. And then you start to wonder what happens to them after you leave this mortal coil. And who's going to take care of them? I mean, I'm trying to, but anyway, here's a, here's a song about that that I think all of you who went on eBay last night and drunk bid on something can appreciate. Sooner or later, we all gonna find that we made it to the end of the line. It gets heavier every mountain you climb. It's the things you leave behind. It's been one of those years when people keep passing into the past. But you're still here, gotta pick up the pieces of your life and theirs. Who gets what or why? We all cart around a whole lot of baggage that would better be left by the side of the road. Books and records, whole clothes and photos carry a heavy load. So sooner or later we're all gonna find that we've made it to the end of the line. It gets heavier every mountain you climb. It's the things you leave behind. Unfinished business, often bears witness to the best of intentions. So clean it up, I'm gonna get to it one day or another before it gets too much. Now I like to forage in somebody's storage as much as the next guy, but you gotta expect that what you find and pass along will keep on keeping on and on. So sooner or later we're all gonna find that we've made it to the end of the line. It gets heavier every mountain we climb. It's the things you leave behind. Well, my friend Jim, he packed it all in to a 12 by 4. Storage space. Boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes. All neatly piled and tucked in place. Now I got an attic and you've got a basement. Put it together and what do you see? A piece of you and a piece of me. Moving on to antiquity. for us for everyone i just i want to thank you it's been a tremendous honor talking with you and 
and um, going through your life. It's, it's an amazing life, Lenny, really. Yeah, you well, are lucky. My life <laughs> and I lucky. Can do what I want. <laughs> you are, it's wonderful. You are a lucky soul. Thank you, thank you and, so much, um, Judith. Thank you, thank you Spence, for us uh, getting this together and uh, glad to be on the Indie Cafe too.